Okay, my friends, get ready. This is going to be very, very interesting. I have been talking about Gaia and the ancient texts and the ancient earliest stories of creation, of, of everything. Well, how did it get here? And really, what is it? What's it made of? What's its final destiny? What's our final destiny? Well, Gaia is what's called a personification of the earth. In other words, it's a living creature. It's a person. However, on, underneath Gaia, it's like Gaia is the surface of a living creature. Underneath Gaia is, an, is something else. That's what we're going to look into now, because somebody confronted me with that, and I was, uh, at first I sort of, uh, but then I started thinking, well, it's a valid, valid point. I'm always talking about all the things that cover the earth. Well, how did they get there on top of the earth? What's under them? You know, I, I pretty much try to put that in there too, as much as I can come up with. But I, I really got to be honest with you, that, that's, that's a, a little bit of a confusing point for me. So we're going to get into it today together. We'll see if we can figure it out. That's all. Okay, my outstanding friends, this is going to be a trip. I mean a trip. Now, if you are here watching this right now, I know there's very little doubt that you understand the concept of Gaia, Gaia, who is the mother of all. Now, I started to go a little deeper into that. I could say, ah, first, you know, the mother of all, yeah, well, I started looking at it and uh, it's starting to make a lot more sense. Because Gaia is literally the earth. And then there's the sky. When you die, the earthly part of you goes back to the earth. The, the other part of you that is your thoughts and all that stuff, you go into, into, into the ether. It is one and the other. This is mind-blowing. So if you want to get your mind blown, you're in the right place. Okay, this is a magical mystery tour for certain. Now, Gaia, remember, is the primordial goddess and the personification of Earth in Greek mythology. They were, the, they were the ones that wrote about all these things. And all the things that they wrote about, as far as I'm concerned, I can find evidence to support a lot of them. Now, here's where Gaia came from, who, who is the Earth and so forth. Gaia emerged from chaos. All right, the whole universe was all spitting this particles this way and that way. And that falls into my dipole electron flood theory, too, because everything is made up of these little tiny particles. And when they hit a certain number, which I say is about 1823, that would be a proton. And then they start building bigger, 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 bigger snowballs, basically. So there's, th that is where the material that underlies everything came from, as far as I can determine. Now, Gaia emerged from the chaos, is considered the supreme mother or goddess by immortals and mortals alike. What does immortals mean? They never die. They don't die. We're mortals. We die, we come, we go. Now, all gods and goddesses are descended from her through her union with Uranus, which is the heaven, and Pontius, which is the sea. All of these creatures, every single one of them, had a personification. They were like Poseidon and, and all these different creatures. Were, they were actually personified as something, just as Gaia is personified as the earth. So there is nothing but but creatures, basically. Even the things that are not creatures are creatures in their origin. Like the wind, the sky, the rain, the ocean. All of those are creatures. All right, pay attention to this, because this is the part that, that's got me right at the moment. Traditionally, Gaia means Earth. And Chinton under or beneath the earth. So Gaia is the shell around the, the under, uh, around the chitin. All right. However, chitin has occasionally the same meaning with the earth. Well, can we see it as two separate entities? Gaia is, is, is life. 
and shitting is the building blocks of life. I guess that, that's how I'm going to look at it from now on. Don't forget, Gaia emerged out of the chaos. There was these things flying every which way, going all over the place, and all of a sudden, a bunch of them came together, and it kicked off life. And could that possibly happen? Yes. Can I show that? Yes. All right, this is a mind blower, way past mind blowing. This is in outer space. Now, this is in the Russian space station. They had a vacuum chamber up there. A vacuum chamber means you, everything is gone from it. There's no particles within inside of it. Then they injected this chaos into that void. Because at, at that point, it's a void. There's nothing there. It's a vacuum chamber. It's a void. These are all little charged particles. They're little dust particles with charges on them. When they went in there and they started to swirl around, they made this DNA strands. These particles are nothing more than the particles that are emitted from the sun. They're the exact same thing that comes off of the sun. If space is saturated with these particles, and it looks to me like they find each other and start curling up in these DNA coils. It certainly looks like to me. Now, this goes way back. This goes back to 2014, I think, 2015. The Russians did this. I commented to them. I t and uh, I actually contacted uh, Fermilab, too, and uh, some other people about this. But there's uh, very little interest at the moment. Who knows? Maybe they'll see this a little differently. As, as I have been showing all of the things that exist that nobody ever even had a clue about that really show that the ancient texts have a lot of truth to them, a lot of truth. And here we're talking about Gaia, we're talking about, you know, creatures. And now I'm going to show you some things that support everything I'm saying in a material way, not just, the, oh boy, that looks like this, that looks like that. No, I'm going to show you stuff that, there's it's just, it's no denying it. And it supports the most ancient texts about the Titans and all that stuff. As far as I'm concerned, it, the Greek mythology is not mythology, it is history. And Apollodorus wrote what it was, and people just couldn't accept it. It was just too far off, so they removed it from all the ancient texts. But if you, it's still there, but you've got to go searching for it, and then you've got to believe it. Or you got to at least think about it if you want to. Most of them they don't think about it because it just sounds crazy. But the things that I have shown show the crazy is, is normal. All right, I'm just going to ask you to listen to this for a moment. This is Apollodorus. He was a historian in, a, I think it was 2nd century BC, and he wrote all of the original texts and consolidated them down to the story of our beginnings. And here's where we started. Here's the first words. The sky was the first who ruled over the whole world who was Gaia. Having wedded earth, which is Gaia, he begat first a hundred handed as they are named, which is these they had a hundred hands and fifty heads. And they were unsurpassed in size and might. Each had a hundred hands and fifty heads. Well, it sounds to me like the DNA was just all screwed up. Because you end up with two two hands for every head. So you got a hundred hands and you got 50 heads, you just got too many, <laughs> they're all globbed together in one ball. So we got to separate them out, so we get two hands and one head in one creature, basically. And then th th These are monsters. They were, they were monsters. And Uranus locked these monsters inside the Earth, down in the chitin, it sounds like to me. And Gaia was very, very upset about this because th those were her children, even though they were monsters. And he just didn't want them around because they were loud and nasty, and he was afraid they were going to try to take over. And they did. They did take over. And th that's where the story starts. This is the start of the story. And if you don't read Apollodorus and at least think about it, well, here's what Apollodorus can say. Listen to this. The theogony, this is all about the beginning of everything. And then the birth of Zeus, who was the god of our realm here. The war of the Titans, Olympian gods. The war of the giants. And Typhon, who was the giant dragon. 
Prometheus and Deucalion. Prometheus molded men out of clay. Deucalion was Noah. And it goes on and on. This is book two, book three. A whole bunch of other stuff. And he's not the only one who wrote about this stuff. Hesiod and um, Ovid. Ovid was over here, I think. No, hold on. Hold on a second. All right, this is the guy you want to read, is Ovid, Metamorphosis. The first words out of his mouth is that these gods could change themselves into anything they want. They could be any sex, they could be any size, they could be planets, they could be anything they wanted, because they were in control of the particles. Metamorphosis just means transformation, like a butterfly from a caterpillar, that type of thing. And these are all of contents. He had all kinds of books. Here's the books he had, 15 books. The creation, how did everything start? Greek mythology is the bod of body of myths originally told by the ancient Greeks and a genre of ancient Greek folklore. Oh no, that's, that's history. Then you got the ages of mankind, the flood, Deucalion, who was Noah. And it goes on and on and on and on and on, on. I mean on and on and on. Now, Metamorphosis, listen to that, and that's the name of this book. Metamorphosis is the transformation, or transformation is the underlying theme amongst all the episodes of Metamorphosis. It's just change. Ovid raises the significance explicitly in the opening lines. He says, In a nova fert animus mutatus de sera forma scopora. I intend to speak of forms changed into new entities. Well, what does that mean? Well, it says accompanying this theme is often violence inflicted upon a victim whose transformation becomes part of the natural landscape. They took the guy and he said, okay, you now you're going to be a mountain. <laughs> The theme amalgamates a much explored opposition of the hunter and the hunted, and the, you know, they throw some stuff in there, which doesn't mean much. This is what really means something right here. There is a great variety among the types of transformations that take place, and they're all written down and documented. Humans into inanimate objects like the Nile River or constellations, or into animals or into plants from animals like ants into fungi and mushrooms into, into humans from one sex to another they could be male and female or both at the same time from one color to another it could be anything they wanted they could do anything they wanted to be so there was no restrictions on the the gods really the ones that were the first ones they were in control. It sounds like everything to me. And when you, I've read, a, a, not a lot, not everything, but a lot. And uh, it's, uh, it's compelling. Very, very compelling. But you really got to have a wide open mind. When they start going through Apollodorus over here. And f hundred heads, I mean 50 heads, 100 hands, and then the Cyclopses. And he put them all in Carter. He cast them all into Tartarus, a gloomy place. And then he had the Titans. The same thing with them. He cast them into Tartarus. And Earth was grieved at the destruction of her children who had been cast into Tartarus, persuaded the Titans to attack their father. And then the whole thing just lays out after that. They cut his testicles off. Seriously, they cut his testicles off with the sky so that he couldn't have any more kids with the earth. And then they, they took over. And um, it is a big, a big long story. And it, it, it mimics a lot of what you hear in the Bible and all the other stuff about how there was a great red dragon going to eat the baby and somebody swooped in and took the baby up and hit him out for so much, such amount of time. And that was Zeus. Right? And it was, I don't know. The whole thing is just so confusing. We have to dig through one step at a time. And that's what I've been trying to do. But i got to be honest with you. I, 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 it, it, it muddles itself. There's so much to it. It's, it you, can't, you can't keep a nice clear line because 
once you hit a certain place, it's like you fell into a mud hole. And then you, how do you get out of that? Well, you got to figure out something. <laughs> so, he really cut his genitals off and threw them into the sea. And like, uh, the nymphs, she hid in Zeus, enraged at this, Rhea repaired to, re, repaired to Crete. She hid out in Crete where she was big with Zeus. She was pregnant. She brought him forth in a cave. The nymphs fed the child on some kind of milk from Amalthea. And the curities, which are the armed guards, stayed around. And every time the baby started screaming, they would start clashing their spears on their shields in order that Kronos might not hear the child. What happened was she gave Kronos a stone wrapped in swaddling cloth to, to eat because he was eating all the babies. He eat every baby. And they were stuck inside of Earth, in the belly of Earth. And uh, it's just, <laughs> yikes. It just sounds insane, but like I said, insane is the new normal.